Welcome and good afternoon. I am Kim Rubin, Saul Price Fellow of the Tax Policy Center and Director of the State and Local Finance Initiative at the Urban Institute. It is my great pleasure to welcome you here today to be part of a conversation about the challenges facing our country's counties. This is part of a series of events we are hosting examining the fiscal pressures on different levels of state and local governments. And with COVID-19 cases beginning to rise again in two weeks before the election, we turn our attention to counties. Counties are an important level of government, but often people don't know exactly what they do. That's because counties play a dual role. They both act as an agent for their state government, implementing and administering state policies and programs related to both health and human services. But they also provide direct services, more like cities, where they provide police or fire services, maintain and build our roads, and in some places fund and run our schools. These functions vary across our country, but most of the over 3,000 counties in our country are on the front line in maintaining and monitoring our public health and running our elections. And right now, counties are having to do all of this while anticipating budget shortfalls. We are excited to be collaborating with the National Association of Counties, NACO, and to have Taryn Zamuda join us today. In a recent NACO study, counties forecast a $202 billion impact on their budgets through fiscal year 2021, with 88% of counties reporting budget effects. This will lead to cuts or delays in capital investments, probably layoffs or furloughs, and a need to rebalance spending priorities. And little help seems to be coming from the federal or state governments. Indeed, federal stimulus, whatever form that might take, seems to be stuck. And state governments are actually starting to cut funding to counties and other local governments in an, in an effort to balance their own budgets. And so as the pandemic is getting worse, with daily counts growing and more rural counties facing uh, hospital bed short shortages. And with the election two weeks away, it is especially important for us to learn about what's happening on the ground. We are excited to have an excellent panel here today. And, oh, sorry. But first, some quick housekeeping. This event is being recorded and the recording will be posted online afterward. You'll be able to find bios for our panelists and further material about counties on our website on this events page. All participants are muted, but please type your questions or comments into the Q&A box at any time. We will be reviewing these questions throughout the broadcast and are leaving time at the end for the panelists to respond. We encourage everyone in the audience to continue today's bot dialogue by sharing your thoughts or observations on social media using the hashtag pound live at urban. Our panel, panel will be moderated by Lionel Foster, Senior Communications Manager for the Tax Policy Center. who will introduce the other panelists. Thanks again for joining us, Lionel. Thanks, Kim, and hello, everyone. I am very happy to be here. Um, if I seem especially excited, it's because I've not had this much human interaction in a long, long time. I'm wearing a tie for the first time in five months. Um, but thank you for joining us. This is gonna be a fantastic conversation. So I will introduce our panelists. I have a bunch of questions for the panelists, and then we'll get to your questions. As Kim mentioned, please do not be shy about including uh, your questions using the chat feature. It could, you could be inspired by something a panelist says. You might have come uh, to today's event with a question. Uh, I'm sometimes, I'm often very impressed. Uh, we have a really smart audience. Um, you all are sometimes the best part of these events. So the questions you have, we really look forward to. So drop those and we will leave time towards the end uh, for audience Q&A. So our panel. Uh, Kevin Boyce is a commissioner on the Franklin County, Ohio Board of Commissioners. Franklin County has 1.3 million residents, including those who live in the state capital, Columbus. Barry Glassman is county executive for Harford County, Maryland. Harford County is home to 255,000 residents and the Aberdeen Proving Ground, a U.S. Army Research Center. And Taryn Zamuda is deputy chief innovation officer 
and chief economist for the National Association of Counties. So all of our panelists can go, okay, there we go. We can, we can see them all. Uh, you can see them just as well as I can now. So I uh, thank you uh, panelists for joining us. So I'll start with a question for Taryn uh, and then we'll hear from our elected officials. Uh, so Taryn, uh, could you just fill us in on what you're seeing regarding uh, county budgets and operations and just generally some of the challenges posed by the pandemic right now? Well, hello everyone and thank you Lionel and thank you for involving NACO in this webinar today. We're very thrilled to be participating and also doing our very best to represent our county officials across the nation. Um, I'll, I'll provide you kind of a, a, a national overview of what we are seeing in the impacts of COVID-19 related to budgets and our public health systems. But wanna point out that counties are on the front lines of the response during this pandemic. Uh, counties operate over 1900 local public health departments and we support over 900 hospitals across the nation, uh, long-term care facilities. Uh, we have over 58,000 hospital beds and over half a million public health employees in health and hospitals. So it really um, have been critical to mitigating COVID-19 and responding to our, our local residents' needs. Um, Nearly everyone across the nation does live within a county. So I wanna point out it as well, uh, that as, as pointed out in the introduction, the roles and responsibilities of counties are, they spread across many areas of services and needs of local residents, public health being a, a very uh, prominent service and also our, our justice systems, jails, public safety, uh, sheriff departments, things of that nature. So nearly every safety net service at the local level, um, the county does play a role in that. So hospitals, behavioral health, uh, nursing homes. And with the COVID-19 pandemic, as, as uh, kind of you may expect of those items I just listed, nursing homes, hospitals, behavioral health, those all have been hit pretty hard. And um, expenditure, so with with this, this has been a very human crisis across the nation, but with that human crisis and human need, there is a dollar amount that is needed to support the needs of our residents. Um, so we have seen expenditures rising across county budgets and also revenues falling in many areas. Counties are unique in that the revenues are uh, vary. Um, counties receive revenues from property tax primarily, um, but also some counties rely heavily on sales tax, on local option sales tax, on local income taxes. Uh, so with the pandemic and the, the shutdowns, uh, starting back in April, sales taxes hit very hard. In certain counties, that has had a very large impact. In others, the impact has been minimal within sales tax. Uh, property taxes have remained stable. So again, we're talking all these revenues come in and support all the services that go out to our local residents. And when those revenues are cut or, or are at risk of, of future impacts, which we are starting to see and hear now more with the property tax base and this risk of property taxes potentially declining or folks not being able to pay their property taxes in 2021 because of lost jobs or, um, or even property values declining potentially, we, we're, that's still to be seen, but um, we, the, those revenues do have a big impact on the services that counties are providing. So across the nation, the impacts are varied county to county, again, by what that base is for revenue uh, to provide services. Uh, but some counties seeing a trillion dollars in, 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 I'm sorry, a billion dollars in impact on, on the local, on the annual budget line item. So counties like, uh, counties that are in New York or counties like Clark County in Nevada, uh, which is Las Vegas, counties like King County, Washington, that was hit very hard at the beginning of the pandemic, all seeing uh, more severe budget impacts. And um, that will have a long-term impact on what we're able to do for our residents. Thanks, Taryn. Uh, now, for each of our elected officials, by way of introducing yourselves and your jurisdictions, I'll um, ask two questions. One, could you uh, talk about 
what your counties do, what kind of uh, services you have and, and uh, issues you're responsible for. And then two, uh, pre-pandemic, say circa January, what did you think this year would be about for your county? And, um, and, and what are the big things you're, you're dealing with now? How has that changed? We'll start with uh, Kevin Boyce and then go to Barry Glassman. Well, thanks, uh, Lionel. And uh, let me also thank NACO and the Urban Institute for uh, having me today. I'm really excited about this kind of conversation because it allows the public to really see what counties do. And I remember when I first got elected as a county commissioner, everyone would ask me, well, what does a county commissioner do? And so I'd always do these posts. What does a county commissioner do? Well, here's what we do. In Franklin County, um, which is Ohio's largest county, just under 1.4 million residents and vastly growing. Mm -hmm. um, we do uh, a, a wide array of services and resources for the public. Um, spe specifically in the things that are sort of big ticket items, if you will, is we run the county jail. That's not uh, sexy or fun to talk about, but it's important. And, um, you know, we provide um, not only that sort of safety resource for the public, uh, but also implies what we do as folks channel in and out of the system, you know, to try to prevent uh, the recidivism of uh, those who come through our doors. We also are the quote unquote welfare system or what we refer to as the jobs and family services system. This is important, especially in a COVID-19 2020, because our most vulnerable citizens have been even um, more impacted by the uh, global pandemic. And so we really had to stretch and think about how we deliver services, what we have for them, and even being creative about what we can cover versus what we traditionally cover. And then, and then finally, um, we are the court system. Uh, and, and I say finally, I'm just kind of trying to highlight some of the things that we do. Um, we are the court system. We are the election system. We are the children's services system. And so when I think about quality of life and I think about the things that allow families to flourish, all of those things fit somewhere in the realm of ensuring that families have the resources to be able to be successful. Now, uh, Franklin County is a large entity, so that amounts to about a $1.6 billion annual budget. And um, being that there are only three commissioners, we're all elected at large, you know, our job is to really think about how the county delivers its services, but more importantly, what we do. And so um, I like to think of it as while we have those things that I just out, outlined, um, I like to think of it as the ability for us to evolve in 2020 certainly has tested our evolution and tested how we think about service delivery, how we think about growth and how we think about our, our work. Um, you asked another question, which was what do we, how do we exist before the pandemic? Was that the right question, Lionel? Did I get that right? How did we exist before the pandemic? Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Uh, the question was, I'm curious if you can even remember what, say, January looked like. What, what did you think you'd be focusing on this year versus, you know, how the pandemic might have changed that? Right. Um, you know, I mean, we, we really started 2020. Um, so we, it, let me just back up a little bit. In, 20, in 2018, Franklin County was vastly growing. It is the fastest growing county in Ohio um, and on a number of levels. But what we were seeing was poverty was also growing. You know, there wasn't a place that you can go to in Central Ohio and not see orange cones or, um, or cranes in the sky. Um, yet we're also seeing more and more homeless, more and more poverty. And, uh, um, and so we started to really think about that, peel back the layers and dig into what that was. Fast forward to 2020, we were just on the verge of launching what we called the Innovation Center. And the Innovation Center was a hub that was going to be a resource for big ideas in eliminating poverty and racism. And the idea was for that everyday people or anyone could come to us, bring us a concept, an idea, we would vet it, pilot it, and te te vet it, test it, and pilot it. Um, and see if it was something that could really impact racism and poverty. And we were just on the verge of launching that when um, the, the pandemic hit and really slowed things down. And so, and what we saw, and I think Taryn mentioned it, what we saw was while there were disparate numbers on certain groups of people, even before the pandemic, it became um, 
uh, what I would describe as perhaps a second pandemic or maybe even the pandemic before the pandemic. And that's people who were suffering already and now COVID-19 sort of create that environment so that they were suffering even more. And so we thought we would be uh, coming up with big ideas that we really could begin to move the needles in, in these areas. We thought we'd be celebrating, you know, our investments and really evaluating them. And now um, we had to put things on pause as we sort of worked to address the leaks in the boat, if you will, that were immediate, that, that demanded immediate attention. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, Barry, what's, what's the view from Hartford County? And uh, Maryland's my home state, so. Very good, uh, yeah. Hello. Well, I wanna thank everyone for having me. It's good to be on with a colleague uh, uh, from Ohio. Kevin is good. I bought sheep out there. I'm a recovering sheep farmer, so I always try uh, through your county to get to Eaton, Ohio for a big oh, sheep sure. sale every year. Okay. Um, so <laughs> it's good to meet you. Listen, Hartford County, uh, it's about a billion dollar budget county. We are a charter county, of course, uh, that has a legislative branch. Uh, I run the executive branch. So our services range from emergency services, water and sewer, planning and zoning, all those governmental operations that you would normally think of as an executive branch uh, operation, community services, uh, kind of right down the line. Um, and of course, Hartford County is a little bit unique. You know, we're about an hour north of Baltimore and about an hour and 45 minutes uh, north of the nation's capital in Washington. We're a little bit in unique that uh, law enforcement in Hartford County, we still have an elected sheriff, which goes back uh, centuries. So the sheriff is in charge of all uh, law enforcement operations. Uh, the county, uh, which is always the case, it seems like. Uh, I fund them. Uh, I don't have much say on how they spend their money, but they do take a portion of our budget. We have an elected school board. And, and then so in Maryland, most jurisdictions uh, are similar to Hartford County. We spend about 50% of our budget on local education. Uh, and that money is just transferred directly to those local boards and when I say goodbye to it, I have little say again uh, on how those funds are expended. Uh, and the, our, as far as the health department goes, which makes partnerships even more important in Maryland, uh, the local health department is really a state agency. They do get some local funds for uh, septic and, and health department type operations for restaurants and so forth. But uh, regarding the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, most of the public safety uh, directives and handling uh, are funneled down from the state to the local health department and the health officer relates to uh, the county executive branch. There again, I don't have any direct control, uh, but we have to work as partners to uh, facilitate their operations uh, and also uh, the county operations as far as relating uh, to the pandemic. Uh, and in Hartford County, the other unique thing is through the University of Maryland, we have uh, two hospitals and most of our medical system is tied to the University of Maryland system. So we have kind of one healthcare provider uh, that we build partnerships with in response to the pandemic also. So it makes it uh, a little bit different. We have a lot of partnerships. Uh, and um, so like most counties, we live or die on property taxes. <laughs> Uh, and local income taxes. So uh, in Maryland, we don't get a, we don't have a local share of, of the sales tax. And I think primarily that's why you're seeing the state budget in Maryland impacted probably more greatly at this point uh, than uh, local local budgets because in essence, uh, uh, local income taxes right now are holding steady. A lot of that due is due to the um, uh, supplemental unemployment benefits that we do get taxed and we do get a piece of. So that's kind of uh, artificially held up uh, our numbers. So back in February, I was just got through my first draft of our budget. We, we have to present a budget in April. So um, I had planned on fully funding education, their request. And quite frankly, after a long six years, we were just coming out and seeing our revenues start to tick back up from the Great Recession. And so 
we were beginning to feel pretty good that we had built up a little bit of a reserve and you know, started thinking about new programs that we could do uh, some things in the capital budget. A lot of local counties like to pay as you go or use cash, uh, but also we were thinking about going to the bond market uh, for some school projects and, and things like that. Uh, and then, so in March, uh, we really had to rethink everything. I mean, uh, we went ahead and, and funded our education requests fully, uh, but the capital budget, anything with cash, I kind of cut uh, and held on to early on, just because uh, if you remember that, I can remember back March and April was a lot of unknown. We really didn't know how bad uh, in Maryland it was going to get. We were, our numbers there had, had, had been the highest since uh, we've seen all year. Uh, and so as the governor uh, began to shut things down, uh, we got more and more warn warning from our financial consultants and so forth. So uh, that was my first indication that things were not going to be as rosy uh, as we had anticipated. And uh, I had to make folks unhappy as Kevin, you know, you have to do sometimes when I said, you know, we're not going to build this senior center. Uh, we're not going to move this school project. And um, you just had to say no to some things just out of caution. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. And Barry, you already touched up upon some of the, the tough decisions. And it, it seems to me that uh, counties often stand at this unique intersection between various level of government and different other agencies and actors and constituents. And I'm, I, I pitch this question to Kevin first. Um, so during the pandemic, advice about what health measures to take have changed as scientists learn more and information from different levels of government sometimes conflicts. So what processes do you all use to manage and vet this information? And how do you coordinate with other jurisdictions to try to keep people safe? You asking me first or did you say yes, I'm going first? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting question because you know that certainly is gonna depend on a lot of different factors. I mean, I think it starts with the existing relationships that you have with the municipalities. In Franklin County, there are uh, 17 municipalities and there are a number of townships and, and, and other uh, villages and organizations that you have to find a way to interact with. And so what we immediately um, started to do was sort of get our own house in order. Uh, and, and we did a number of things to just begin to think about that internally. You know, do we shut down? Do we manage, how do we manage um, hygiene and cleaning uh, in county facilities. How do we want to, you know, as you all know, while this isn't related to the pandemic, there was a lot of unrest this summer after uh, the tragic uh, incident that happened in Minneapolis. And, and so we were thinking about um, uh, measures within to protect facilities in, in that way. And so the point is, is that because we had really strong existing relationships, we were able to develop a really, I would say, consistent and um, a deliberate um, communication process, not just at the staff level, but at the elected official level, that where we were communicating about sharing resources, about um, coverage of certain elements of the county. Um, interestingly enough, about Franklin County, the way Ohio was designed in terms of our public health districts. Columbus, because it's such a large city itself, Columbus is the 14th largest city in the United States with just uh, about 900,000 plus uh, residents. Um, they have their own health jurisdiction. And so even though that's inside of Franklin County, the jurisdiction of Columbus is different. And so we had both of our health commissioners talking on a regular basis and really sort of um, designing um, how we're gonna go forward in communication and guidance from the state, from the CDC and from the feds mm -hmm. and how we're in, in even working through the other political subdivisions like the school systems and so forth. Um, and so I think that was uh, the critical way, but I, but I would maybe zero in on what we did for Franklin County. We started to meet every single day at 9 a.m. And because it's hard to disseminate information when the information, when the narrative is changing every day. And so we would meet and the day would happen and, you know, there's a sort of information lag, if you will. And so 
the things that happened the night before or during the day were sort of hitting the news and hitting us in, from an information standpoint the next day. And we had to be prepared to respond. So not only were we meeting internally each day at 9 a.m., uh, Monday through Sunday, um, but we were communicating with the larger cities uh, or and at least electeds were, but then for our townships and villages, either we split them up as county commissioners and, and, and engage based on relationships or geographic region. Um, but, but it was, but we knew that communication was the utmost important element of navigating a very unknown kind of environment for everybody. And so, um, and, and I would just add that we're still figuring it out. You know, um, we went from a total shutdown to quasi shutdown to now we're in this space of who knows one minute it's our numbers are going one direction the next minute they're going another and the bottom line is what we do know is we've got to be prepared for the very worst and so each day is about making sure we're ahead of what may come given the worst case scenario so Taryn, i want to go to you so kevin just gave us a fascinating look kind of on the ground in real time in franklin county what are some of the patterns in public health responses you're seeing from counties uh, across the country? Yeah, I, I think I want to expand on a point Kevin just made, uh, Commissioner Boyce just made on the communication and the trust in local government and, and how local government plays a critical role in that communication piece to residents. Uh, as a trusted source of information on relaying information on um, testing sites or how to receive how to receive any medical care at the at the local level. So really we we have heard across the nation, similar to what Commissioner is saying, with um, daily meetings at the local level, daily morning meetings to talk about what has happened the night before, what to communicate out that day, what action needs to be taken on a day-to-day -day basis. So very much a uh, information in, constantly changing and adapting and adapting and, and really uh, remaining malleable throughout the crisis to, to uh, respond to the change, the constant change. Some changes and trends that we've seen within county public health across the nation, I think at first we really saw this survival mode response okay, how many hospital beds do I have? What are my cases looking like? What is the trend within my county? Um, what kind of PPE do I need to adhere? How do I get it? Do I need to partner with surrounding counties or with a municipality, a larger city, an urban area to get that PPE? Um, at the beginning, it was ventilators as well, trying to, to get ventilators within the county. And we saw a lot of cross collaboration between not only across county lines, but again, working with states and cities to, to get what was needed at the local level. Um, counties were also on, you know, right there building field hospitals to help with capacity. Um, in the, again, especially out, if we remember back when King County was getting hit very hard at the beginning. Um, and one, and also being innovative. Uh, they, with, in, especially in larger counties, we saw um, across the nation in Texas and in, in Washington and New York, counties either purchasing or leasing hotel motel spaces to help house homeless population. So again, to help mitigate the spread of COVID-19, give those that need the space the space and 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 pay for those needs as well. Um, we have seen since then seen it evolve into more focus on testing, screening, and contact tracing. Uh, we have a county, um, San Miguel County in Colorado, uh, that right now is part of a an antibody testing pilot project. So where uh, a small county, 8,000 residents are getting this antibody testing. And then uh, the idea would be to scale up if, if the pilot works into larger communities. So um, a lot of innovation, a lot of on the ground work, um, a lot of adjustments, especially with telehealth. We're seeing a, a big um, boom in, in telehealth usage at the local level, administering mental health needs via telehealth as well with from the local public health department. Um, a lot of malleability, a lot of innovation and, um, and certainly that local response. Thank you. So we've already heard uh, even in this short conversation a fair bit about what some of the needs are at the county level. Let's talk about 
federal aid, and I'll, I'll go to you first, Barry. Um, the federal aid that has already uh, been approved, how has that shown up in your area, if, if at all? And, and looking ahead as, as jurisdictions around the country are clamoring for more because it's needed, what, what, what are the needs um, as, as you see them in, in your jurisdiction? So, and one of the unique things about Maryland, and Lionel probably remembers this, but uh, when the first CARES Act uh, passed uh, Congress, uh, there was money in there, uh, CARES funding for uh, local jurisdictions to use for economic support for businesses. And then the other half was for PPP and other medical uh, related expenses due to COVID-19. Well, what um, many counties in Maryland discovered right away uh, in that bill, uh, only five jurisdictions over a population, I think it was a 500,000, but in Maryland, five jurisdictions got their mo money automatically uh, from the federal government. Uh, we soon discovered that the state of Maryland was thinking about holding the rest of the money to the other uh, 19 jurisdictions uh, and um, having us come to them and ask for reimbursement after we spend money, which for most of us, we didn't have that kind of money to spend and ask to be reimbursed for. So one of the great things that I have to plug, uh, the Maryland Association of Counties, which is a member of NACO, uh, but all of our jurisdictions team together and we went to the governor, the budget secretary, and make sure that all of our jurisdictions got their federal money directly sent to them if they wanted it. So uh, by late May, uh, early June, we had our CARES funding uh, for a county our size, according to the formula, was about $44 million, uh, about 22 million for economic business support, and the other was for uh, all of our COVID-19 related uh, expenses. Uh, but it was a tough couple of months there. You can imagine seeing my neighbor, Baltimore County, roll out support and uh, buy laptops for their students and and here, uh, many rural suburban counties had not uh, received any funding. So uh, that CARES funding has been really a lifesaver for us for our business grants. Uh, we just did a restaurant grant program uh, as restaurants prepare for cold weather. Uh, we've been able to use the COVID-19 to stockpile our um, PPE and all those uh, uh, medical related expenses for the uh, local school system. Uh, and so we're pretty good right now. We're struggling and I'm uh, waiting on a call from one of our Senator Van Hollen today uh, to see if they're gonna expend that. Right now, local counties have to spend that money by December 31st uh, or turn it back in. Uh, we are uh, waiting to see if in fact, uh, do we need to spend it all or are they gonna extend that deadline so we have it uh, in case the numbers and it looks like it could be a tough uh, that in fact, we have some funds to fall back on. I'm not too hopeful that we'll see another uh, influx if there's gonna be another package. I know there's not gonna be anything before uh, the end of the year. So we're, we're hoping to, to do that. We have seen the federal aid, it has helped us. And, and so uh, right now we're kind of in that, air, you know, with the election and so forth, we just don't know what uh, the next step could be. Yeah, no, I here Barry uh, assuming another package if it's coming won't won't be here by the end of the year and I I, I imagine a lot of people are, are making the, the same uh, assumptions uh, Kevin uh, of the, the aid that's been dispersed how has it shown up uh, Barry talked about some of the ways he and colleagues really had to fight to get the money up front what's what's that look like in uh, Franklin County sure we had the same fight and I, I know what uh, Barry went through for Franklin County um, you know, there was part of the model they were initially considering. It subtracted Columbus's numbers out of Franklin County, which took us below the 500,000 threshold. And uh, even after they uh, made the adjustment, um, we still got less money than um, the city of Columbus got. You know, city of Columbus got $175 million. We got $75 million. And, and what the part that I, I feel like the, the federal government um, overlooked is that we carry out very different services of uh, the way we're structured because we're not a charter uh, county. You know, we carry out a very um, explicit but different uh, set of duties. 
Um, you know, I, I, you know, I, I think it very much matches with what Taryn and, and Barry said, you know, how we were using funds. I mean, when you think of all the plexiglass, face mask, and um, cleaning supplies that are needed, not just for county facilities, but for small nonprofit agencies, for small businesses. And if you recall, there was just initially a shortage to access anything. It wasn't about funds. It just wasn't available because it was being utilized so quickly. And so, you know, you know, once everything settled down and production sort of got underway for this, um, we really looked at, I think, we really you have used the funds in two or three different ways. One, to um, organize and set up our own internal safety measures, whether right? it's signage for uh, uh, social distancing or a ready and available disposal mask uh, in our building um, or signage with regard to just even the rules operating hours or whatever information might be appropriate. The second was to ensure that nonprofits and businesses had those. And so we issued grants to allow them from our funds to allow them to be able to purchase those things because at the end of the day, it was all about public safety and public health. And so it wasn't about, okay, let's hoard the money for Franklin County and do all the things we need to do. It was as much about dispersing it and so supporting businesses as much as we can. And then finally, then you get into this whole sort of lost revenue situation from the shutdown and how the cycle of that impacts everything. And so we started really thinking creatively about how to support struggling small businesses. I think Barry talked about uh, some of the restaurants getting grants and the support and help, you know, they're the lifeline of a lot of communities and a lot of, um, you know, in, uh, in terms of employment um, situations for families. And so, um, so we wanted to be thoughtful about that and put money out. Today, I'll share a little, a few little statistics with you. Today, um, through uh, October 1st, the county has already allocated three-fourths of our coronavirus uh, fund, which was $76.3 million, I was off by a couple million, um, to support those, those various initiatives. Um, while the Corona Relief uh, Fund and other federal sources are there to cover our expenses incurred in 2019, we are really trying to look at getting ahead of 2021, given we don't know when we come out of this pandemic. And so we're already thinking about what are the things that we can address now with the 20 with the uh, CARES Act dollars that we just aren't anticipating yet for 2021. So that's what we're thinking through now in this sort of last phase of spending the last quarter of the funds that we were given. And then finally, let me say that, you know, what we also are realizing with these funds, and I do also wanna thank Congress for getting us those funds. Um, uh, but I think this, I believe that because there is no bottom in sight, um, we haven't seen the worst of the coronavirus impact, um, not um, public health wise, not economically, and maybe even not socially. And so we are um, creating committees to begin to just think through what that may look like for 2021. It'll be different than 2020 because, you know, it was the novel coronavirus, first time we ever saw it. And now we've learned a lot going into 2021. And so it's a lot different conversation. Nonetheless, we've got to begin to prepare for it. And that's where we are to try to spend that last quarter of funds looking at and anticipating our challenges for 2021. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about elections uh, in some states around the country. We're already seeing record turnout uh, weeks yeah. before the, the actual election date. So I, I'll go to Taryn first, are there, you talk about innovation and I know you think about that every day, Taryn, and county level in innovation. What are some of the, the really unique things uh, counties are doing to help ensure safe, uh, elect, uh, safe voting during the pandemic that, that falls on a, you know, a presidential election year? Maybe you know, one or two examples and then I'd, I'd love to hear from Barry and Kevin uh, what voting practices look like in their areas. Absolutely, counties do play a, a big role in administering the election. So when you're going in uh, to, to vote, it's 
those operations are run by the county typically. Um, so additional precautions obviously have had uh, have had to be taken because of the pandemic, uh, which requires um, additional workers and protocols, systems in place, planning for the county on how to administer the elections locally. Um, so we are seeing counties uh, install additional drop boxes around the county to drop off ballots. Um, also uh, bringing in more, more workers and helping with communication efforts. So ramping up communication within the community on how exactly to vote, where you can, if there is the option of uh, dropping off a ballot, making sure that residents are aware of, of those options. Um, some counties are also working with non local nonprofits to, um, to ensure that these communication efforts are taking place and also the, the operations are, are running smoothly. So um, we are overall seeing, um, seeing kind of the counties taking a proactive approach in administering these elections both safely and in the current kind of climate, um, ensuring that folks can can get out and, and do what they need to do to vote in whatever method is appropriate in the given jurisdiction. Right, so different practices and in, in, in some jurisdictions, I even see you know multiple options for how, how you get mm -hmm. your ballot in. Um, sure. We'd love to hear briefly from Barry, then Kevin, before we I go to some of the audience questions. Um, Barry, like what, what does voting look like right now in, in Hartford County? So in, in Hartford County, we've been, we started early with um, uh, messaging, although our state board of elections sets the rules and we have a local board of elections that carries out the state uh, guidelines and how they're gonna run the election. Of course, at the local level, we provide facilities, we get them clean, uh, we're helping with PPE. And so polling stations, we're working closely to make sure that goes as smoothly as possible. Uh, but during the summer, we've already started uh, plan your vote. So we, I joined with other county executives in, in Maryland to really begin messaging early on to plan your vote, whether it's vote by mail, uh, use a drop off, or in fact, if you have to go to a polling station. I still, uh, we still think uh, as a public health measure, it is safer and, and to provide those alternatives uh, to keep the crowds down and the size of uh, the backups and so forth at these polling stations. So uh, I've been a big proponent of, of trying to, to get, uh, and it's new for Harper County, the, the vote by mail. So it's the first time our primary went well. And, and I think it's just messaging and, and getting folks more comfortable with doing it that way. Uh, we got uh, paid for some additional drop-offs around the county and so my hope is to get these numbers up. So on election day, those folks that really want to and have to get to a polling station can do so without an eight hour wait, you know, which I think in today's world is kind of outrageous that you have to go and wait eight hours to vote. So uh, we wanna make sure there's some other alternatives there uh, to do that. So as usual in, in Maryland, the state sets the rules and uh, kind of relies on counties to make sure there's enough polling uh, stations and that they're gonna be clean and safe. And um, as some folks have talked about, we've done some tabletop exercises also. Um, one thing that we always have to be concerned with public safety uh, to make sure that on election day, it goes smooth, that everyone can get in uh, without intimidation, uh, that we have organized safe uh, election day. So uh, when everyone else is kind of voting in the back of my mind, I've still got to be worried that we keep everybody safe and everybody can get out to vote. Right. So Kevin, what are, I mean, Franklin County is a big jurisdiction. You know, what, what are some of the precautions you all are taking? I mean, all of the above. I mean, I, I think of it in terms of um, plexiglass, Perel and, and protection. You know, we've got um, all of the plexiglass measures that we didn't have before uh, the pandemic. You know, we've got uh, Perel uh, in a hundred places in the facility, in and out. We've got um, social distancing. You know, the challenge with with some of that though is many of the facilities that 
or I, I can't speak for other counties, let me just speak for Franklin County. Our facility was not built for this kind of setup. And, it, you know, honestly, Liana, I think that it's time for us to really start thinking about building a facility specifically for an election and specifically for hosting and maintaining large types of events. Because you think about it, an election is every year, you know, uh, and you know, the presidential election just gets all the attention every four years, but, but we host elections every year, multiple times during the year, if you consider primaries and special elections and whatnot. And I think it's time for us to think of facilities that are built uniquely for these events um, and to provide for safety measures. Let me give you an example. With, pan with the pandemic and the social distancing policy that we've been instilled, even if you have a reasonable line, you know, because of social distancing, that line could wrap around the building that normally may not even be outside of the building, but because of social distancing, you know, we've created a situation and there are safety elements for us to consider, you know, and, and we don't want to create an environment where voters are discouraged from voting on election day. You know, I don't know about you, but when I pull up and I see any kind of line, it's discouraging. You know, I don't care where it is, grocery store, I'm like, oh man, I, I can do this another day. You know, uh, I'm that guy, you know, but um, um, we've got to think about what that means for our seniors, what that means for folks who are disabled, what that means for new American voters. And so I, I really, I think while uh, a lot of our challenges are being met. We're going to get through this election. It's going to be a successful election. I really believe that. Um, it's the silver lining is that it's time for us to really rethink how we deliver the electoral process, uh, not just in Franklin County, but perhaps America. And so the, the safety measures, I, I should add, you know, these are safety measures really that should be in place even without a pandemic. You know, when you think about it, you know, think about the spread of the flu and other kinds of disease we're dealing with on a, on a regular basis. And, you know, we don't know what's going to happen with the coronavirus in terms of um, its um, future when there's a vaccine, if there's a vaccine, you know, it could be like the flu where, yeah, there's a vaccine, but it just mutates into another version. And then you're constantly chasing that version. And so we should really think about these social distancing and safety measures on an ongoing basis, you know, beyond this. And I think that's something that we've yet to really talk about. Uh, I'll close with saying this, uh, you know, for our county meetings, for example, there are three commissioners. We have a hearing room, it's pretty good size, but it's not designed for social distancing or this, this, the, the safety measures. And so we're looking at how can we fit that now going forward to be accommodating of um, quote unquote, the new normal around how we um, live our lives and, and host public meetings and, and just engage in large crowds and bodies. And so to me, that's the real question for us. You know, we're, we're getting through this time now, but what do we do going forward? Right. So one thing Kevin just pointed to is how these very particular conditions, challenges of the pandemic should force us to rethink the way we provide certain services, especially as they play out in physical locations. So a variation on that theme, and it's a question inspired by a question that came in from an audience member. Thank you for this. Just thinking that the, the boundaries of counties and the, the powers you all have, a lot of this was established a long, long time ago. And you all have already referenced some quirky things about you know, what's within your physical and thematic jurisdiction and what's not. Has, has operating during the pandemic uh, you know, brought up any conversations about the way, say, county physical boundaries and county powers should or, or need to change? Um, what, what, what are your thoughts on that? We'll start with, with Barry and then Kevin. Yeah, one thing, um, it, when we talked about communication earlier, one, one, uh, the, in Maryland, the five, uh, the eight big counties are called the big eight. We would get on the phone uh, once a week, the county executives, and commiserate a little bit on how bad things were, but we'd also talk about best practices, what we were doing that was working. One unique thing that we began to run into after the governor did a first few of his executive orders um, the governor then started saying after an executive order, well, the county executives can be more restrictive than what I'm saying. 
Uh, and so he may he may have said, you know, restaurants can open at 50 percent. And of course, they do an executive order. Counties then have to interpret it and enforce it. But he also said at the end, well, in some jurisdictions, if the county executive wants to do 75 percent uh, or no more restrictive, so 25 percent, uh, he, a county executive can only be more restrictive than, than what I have said. Well, that put a lot of pressure on some of my colleagues uh, right next door in Baltimore County. Uh, I may say, well, I'm gonna go ahead and open at 50%, but they may not have been comfortable with that. In fact, their numbers may have been, uh, their metrics may have been higher than mine. So the county executive there may have said, well, we're gonna wait a couple of weeks to do that. Of course, then he gets under tremendous pressure uh, by local businesses and citizens that say, well, I can go right over the line to Hartford County and go eat in a restaurant and I can't even go in my own county. So uh, that's something we're still struggling with. Uh, we've been dealing with that now uh, with everything, and even with school systems. Some school systems this week started back hybrid in Hartford County, say a day a week for K through two. Uh, in Baltimore County, they're gonna wait to November. So. Uh, some of that has uh, really resulted in a kind of disjointed response uh, geographically around the state, and uh, it can vary from county to county. So that's an interesting thing we've been dealing with about boundaries and, and, and so forth. Uh, same question for you, Kevin. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know that I can articulate better than Barry just did, because he just really summed up, I think, what we're all thinking about, we're all challenged with, but the only thing that I would add, and this is a little deviation from the actual question, so I apologize to the person who asked it if it doesn't quite get at it, but um, I think that it's, it's a, this is a good opportunity for us to rethink how we invest in public health. You know, I think before the pandemic, you, you didn't see, at least in Ohio and Franklin County, you didn't see what I thought was the type of focus of resources and dissemination of information through public health that, uh, we should have seen, you know, we saw, you know, when you, when I, before the pandemic, public health was all about um, communicable diseases and uh, 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 sexually transmitted diseases and, and TB and the things that, and hepatitis and the things that are sort of been a part of our history, but, but they quietly set off in the corner as, you know, this agency that, um, that we didn't think about a global pandemic for, we didn't think about day-to-day -day hygienic practices or, um, you know, processes. And so I think this will be an opportunity for us to really think about how we're funding public health, how public health is structured in Ohio. In Ohio, they have um, independent jurisdictions. So we have a, a county public health system, but they have their own board that sort of navigates them. Yeah, their budget comes through the commissioners, but but their policy is, is done uh, through their board and their operations are done through their board. And so I think here's an opportunity for us to rethink how we deliver public health. The other part is that, you know, it doesn't make sense that we have this Franklin County Public Health and embedded is this large city of Columbus and they've got a separate jurisdiction. We need to be one. We need to work together in a seamless way to ensure that we're protecting the, the, the public uh, at the highest level. And I think oftentimes it's, and it's kind of like what Barry was indicating. You know, I get constituent calls from someone who said, well, my business is here and Columbus um, cited me and shut me down. And my, my uh, opponent or my um, 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 competition across the street that, who are not in the city of Columbus, they didn't get cited by the county. They don't see them as in violation. And so you've got mixed messages going on and, and we need a, a consistent flow of information in, um, in the policy application. So, you know, Kevin mentioned uh, again that the county level role in protecting and administering public health. Um, Taryn, we, I think we should anticipate that uh, if, if and hopefully when we get a vaccine, counties will play a vital role in helping distribute vaccines. So what, what types of logistics will be involved in that? And I believe it was just last week as state level plans for helping distribute vaccines were due, at least those initial state level plans. So how, how are counties preparing for this? Yeah, so the state level plans to the CDC were due on Friday for vaccine distribution. 
And now moving forward, I mean, the local government will be responsible for adhering to those state level plans and uh, distributing the vaccine. Uh, so the local public health departments will play a big role in that distribution. Um, it, what, a couple of key uh, components that the local government will be responsible for uh, identifying critical populations. So there will be the first phase, at least the vaccine will likely be a limited number, a limited quantity. So there will be um, a supply um, kind of issue there. there so, we'll, so we'll need to identify those critical populations that should receive the vaccine first. Um, and then the local public health will also be responsible for planning uh, for um, provider outreach and enrollment. So those that are um, it, those that are involved in administering the vaccines themselves, and then storage is going to be a, a large issue, a large component as well. Um, these vaccines will likely have a shelf life on them once they are delivered locally. So they will have to be administered within a certain number of days, of likely a very short time frame, and also stored at a certain temperature. So. Uh, local government will play a role in, in all of those components and, and we'll see more details uh, play out as in the coming months, but I think this will be a huge shift in focus for um, for conversation in the next couple months and talking about that coordination between federal, state and local. Yeah, well, uh, Kevin or, or Barry or, or both, we have just a few minutes left. You know, Taryn laid out logistically some of what will will be involved. Have you all been part of conversations at your county level about what that kind of rollout and coordination could look like? Well, the gov in, in Maryland, the governor, Governor Hogan, just released about an hour ago his phase one, phase two uh, plan that, that talks about some of the things that Taryn talked about. Doesn't really go into a lot of detail on um, how it's gonna be done. It is gonna require a great deal of infrastructure to contact folks, to remind them for their second dose uh, infrastructure, to refrigerate and so forth. So I think it even, it adds an extra impetus, I think that the federal government, if there is a phase two of CARES funding, it's gotta be related to uh, mm -hmm. vaccines and getting dollars to the locals to be able to carry this out. Um, and just one final thing, one plug for MAKO, we've been fighting this for several years and it backs up what Kevin said. Public health in Maryland is the only agency is still operating on pre-recessionary dollars. Uh, the cuts that they took uh, during the last Great Recession, uh, every other agency in the state of Maryland before the epidemic had been restored, uh, their cuts restored. In Maryland, they're still operating uh, below that. And it's really caught us off guard. and. Um, to some extent in Maryland, it's why we're handling it as a, uh, through MEMA and emergency management, we're handling it sort of as a disaster and using that infrastructure, because quite frankly, in Maryland, public health does not have that kind of infrastructure uh, to handle uh, an epidemic like this. So, but that's all, I'll let Kevin give a shot there, but I think he's right there. That's uh, one area that we're gonna have to, uh, to beef up uh, our, our revenue support of. Yeah, I'm not sure I have much to add to that, other than to say that, you know, um, we're going to need early guidance from uh, the federal government around um, the dissemination uh, protocol. You know, um, you know, obviously medical providers and first responders are going to be uh, at the top of the list of the priority um, uh, spectrum, but we've got to really think about um, all the things that, that Barry and Taryn laid out around um, storage and um, um, access and, um, and, and how, that, how that's going to play out. And so, I, again, I just want to say this is an opportunity for us to really think about the role of public health in American society. When you think about our early years as a country, public health was a critical um, element and maybe not as evolved, obviously, but uh, was a critical element to stopping a number of diseases that uh, were very serious uh, for this country. Uh, and so, you know, once again, here we are, I think, I think we got a little lax. And, and, I, and I say that as a leader um, where I haven't, over the years, I hadn't spent much time thinking about the funding of public health, you know? Um, but I think it's also uh, imperative that the public health leaders um, be stronger advocates for funding and be stronger advocates for better public policy that relates to being proactive uh, on all edges and helping ensure that we all understand 
the depth and the value of public health in the bigger system. Well, thank, thank you all. I want to thank our panelists, Kevin Boyce, Barry Glassman, Taryn Zamuda, thank NACO, thank our audience. This has been, I think, a, just a tremendous insight into an education about what counties can do, how vital they are, and, and what their work will look like going forward. So uh, that's it for this event. And if you'd like to learn more about other Urban Institute events, uh, go to our website, sign up for our newsletters. We would love to see you again. Take care. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Stay in touch. Thank you. Take care, guys.